Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing receptor desensitization, where we're specifically looking at the desensitization of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. Okay, so we're now going to discuss what the cyclic AMP does. So we've seen how, um, so far, when we add uh, adrenaline onto the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, it's going to interact with its um, GS, heterotrimeric G protein, to produce the alpha S GTP subunit. Okay, that's going to then activate the adenyl cyclase enzyme, whichever isoform of adenyl cyclase it is, um, which will then create us uh, cyclic AMP from ATP. Okay, now what is cyclic AMP going to activate? What's well, going to activate the protein kinase A, or more properly, and the name that you'll hear this referred to as if you read primary research papers or reviews, is the cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase. Cyclic AMP dependent protein kinase. More co well, more commonly referred to um, by students at least as protein kinase A. Okay, so this is protein kinase A, and which we'll refer to just as PKA, protein kinase A. Now, basically, uh, there is more than one type of protein kinase A. In fact, there's two. Uh, and we need to discuss their differences um, because we are going to activate type 2 protein kinase A. And in order for me to explain what that means, we need to discuss what type 1 protein kinase A is, and therefore how type 2 is different. So, protein kinase A, there are two types, type 1 and type 2. Type 2 is the sort that's going to be important for us when we're looking at the desensitization pathway. Type 1 will be very important in actually um, carrying out many of the functions uh, that the beta-2 adrenergic receptor aimed to activate. So what's the difference between the two? Well, basically, type 1 is soluble. Or, well, I don't know whether soluble, but it's free. It's free in the cytoplasm of the cell. It's not attached to anything. It's free in the cytoplasm. Whereas type 2 is attached to um, proteins which are themselves attached to the phospholipid bilayer, we'll see these proteins later, attached to plasma membrane. So these ones are targeted. They are in a very specific location, and they will phosphorylate the things which are nearby them in that complex. These ones are free in the cytoplasm and can have much more generic function. Okay, right. So now, what I want to discuss is the structure of protein kinase A, because this is quite complex as well. Um, protein kinase A basically exists in what are known as R2-C2 complexes. Okay? Now, an R2-C2 complex, I'll draw a cartoon of it, like so. Okay, so this, which I'm drawing now, is a regulatory subunit of protein kinase A. Okay, and here, again, is another regulatory subunit. So basically, protein kinase A does not just consist of one polypeptide. It consists of multiple polypeptides joined together in a complex known as the R2C2 complex. Okay, so you have these two regulatory domains of protein kinase A. So these are regulatory domains of protein kinase A regulatory, or regu sorry, not regulatory domains, regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, of PKA. Okay, and you dimerize them together like so. So you've got two regulatory uh, subunits of protein kinase A. Now there are two genes that you can use for these regulatory subunits of protein kinase A. There is the R1 gene, so there is the type 1 regulatory subunit of protein kinase A, which is the type that you have in type 1 protein kinase A, and there is the R2 protein kinase A, which is the type that you have in type 2 protein kinase A, so the type 2 regulatory subunit. Okay. Then, you also have two catalytic subunits of protein kinase A here. So these 
little circles, these are the catalytic subunits of protein kinase A. Catalytic subunits of protein kinase A. Subunits of PKA. Right, so this is really important to understand. The catalytic subunits of protein kinase A, these are the bits which actually do the phosphorylation. These are the bits which phosphorylate other proteins. The regulatory subunits just bind to them and inhibit them. So when they're bound in this complex like this, this R2C2 complex, and hopefully you can now work out why it's called an R2C2 complex. It's got two regulatory domains, sorry, regulatory subunits, and two catalytic subunits. So it's a tetramer, an R2C2 tetramer. Okay, um, but basically the catalytic subunits, there's only one type of catalytic subunit. So it's the same whether you are talking about a type 1 protein kinase A R2C2 complex or a type 2 R2C2 complex of protein kinase A. Okay, uh, so the bit that differs is the regulatory subunit. And the regulatory subunit determines whether it binds or not to these um, complexes at the plasma membrane. So type 2 regulatory subunits of protein kinase A, these will bind to proteins that are at the plasma membrane, and they will end up in complexes at the plasma membrane, so they will end up targeted. Type 1 regulatory subunits of protein kinase A don't uh, bind to these proteins that are uh, at the plasma membrane and therefore don't end up targeted in these complexes. So let's colour in this picture. So here in red, this is the regulatory subunit and this can either be a type 1 regulatory subunit and if it is a type 1 regulatory subunit, you end up with a type 1 protein kinase A or it can be the type 2 regulatory subunit, in which case you end up with a uh, type 2 protein kinase A. Okay, and whichever regulatory subunit you use, you end up with these same catalytic subunits here, which I'll draw in blue. Now, these catalytic subunits, they are the same no matter what, but they are also inhibited when they bind to the uh, regulatory subunits, okay? So they are not active at the moment, and in order to activate them, you need to get rid of their interaction with these regulatory subunits. So you need to break them away from their regulatory subunits. Okay, right, and that's what cyclic AMP is going to do. Cyclic AMP will bind in these four cyclic AMP binding sites here, which is what these little furrows are. Sorry, I haven't explained that previously. These little holes, these are cyclic AMP binding sites. So the cyclic AMP will bind in these four binding sites, and what will happen is it will change the conformation of these regulatory subunits, like so. So now what you'll have is you'll have Here's one regulatory subunit, here's another regulatory subunit, and now they've all got cyclic AMP bound to them, which I'll just denote as a little ball sitting inside these sockets. Okay, and we'll have the cyclic AMP in purple here. So in purple, this is cyclic AMP bound to these cyclic AMP binding sites, and it causes the change in the conformation of the regulatory subunit uh, that then... Um, which I've drawn, basically, is it straightening out, it losing this corner, basically, um, which then releases the catalytic subunits of the protein kinase A, and they now go off and can phosphorylate other proteins, serine and threonine residues of other proteins. So here, off go the catalytic subunits on their own little adventure. Okay, right. So those are the two different types of protein kinase A. So what type is going to be important in the desensitization of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor? What's well, going to be type 2 protein kinase A? Okay, right. So now let's introduce these complexes which type 2 protein kinase A binds to at the membrane. Well, basically, the proteins that type 2 protein kinase A can bind to are known as ACAPs, okay? And ACAP stands for A kinase, which is just another name for protein kinase A. It's just a, um, a way, basically, the same protein kinase A. A kinase anchoring protein. So it's just a protein uh, which can anchor protein kinase A at the plasma 
membrane. Okay, so basically what you find is that at the plasma membrane, you don't just have protein kinase A disorganized. Instead, you have a very organized arrangement. So let me show this now. Okay, so here's the plasma membrane. What you'll have basically is the beta-2 adrenergic receptor will be positioned here. Okay, then its G protein will be very close by. So here's this GS heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, nearby that you'll then have the adenylyl cyclase enzyme. Okay, so here's your adenylyl cyclase enzyme. And then bound to the adenylyl cyclase generally will be your A kinase anchoring protein. Okay, so here will be your A kinase anchoring protein. So this is your A cap. And this will then have the protein kinase A of the second type, the type 2 protein kinase A bound to it. So here is uh, the um, R2 regulatory subunit, the type 2 regulatory subunit, because remember, the type 1 regulatory subunit doesn't bind to these complexes. And when I was talking before, generically, this is what I mean specifically. The type 1 regulatory subunits do not bind to A kinase anchoring proteins. Type 2 regulatory subunits Okay, so we'll label these up as R2 subunits. They do bind to A caps. Okay, so um, so they um, will be uh, targeted to these specific portions of the plasma membrane and held very closely to uh, the beta 2 adrenergic receptor. Okay, so that's the difference between type 1 and type 2 protein kinase A, that type 2 binds to, or at least the regulatory subunits bind to, the A caps, and type 1, the regulatory subunits do not bind to the A caps. So here are your catalytic subunits in blue here. Okay, so these are your catalytic subunits of protein kinase A. Right, now, uh, these A caps then, which A cap actually is it? Catalytic subunit of protein kinase A. So basically, there are absolutely loads of different uh, A caps in a cell. So which A cap actually is it here? Well, basically, this is a this is um, this is on the edge of science, on the edge of what is known. However, there is some experimental evidence uh, saying that A cap seventy nine, which is also known as 150, so A cap 79 slash 150 could be uh, involved in this. So A cap 79 or slash 150 could perform this role. And also, another one that's capable of performing this role, we think, is A cap 250. Okay, and two separate groups were involved in showing this, so I'll give their references. So Fraser et al. showed this. Okay, and also uh, Lin et al. showed this. So those are the two references if you really want um, to put me on the edge. Uh, so there you go. Those are the references for uh, those A caps being involved in this complex, uh, which is going to regulate the, um, the desensitization of this beta 2 adrenergic receptor. So basically, you have a whole complex of all these things linked together so that the entire signaling pathway components are nearby one another. So, let me go over this then now. When the beta 2 adrenergic receptor becomes activated in pink, so here's the beta 2 adrenergic receptor, what it's going to do is it's going to activate the alpha subunit here of the uh, heterotrimeric GSG protein, which is then going to go and activate the adenylyl cyclase enzyme over here. Okay, and what then is going to happen is that the adenylyl cyclase enzyme will produce cyclic AMP, which will then go and bind to these four cyclic AMP binding sites on the type 2 regulatory subunit of the type 2 protein kinase A. That will release these catalytic subunits, and these catalytic subunits are now going to phosphorylate the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, and they are going to be responsible uh, for its desensitization. Okay, right, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video.